Well Read Books is proud to announce the release of an important new title, The Revolutionary Legacy of Rosa Luxemburg. Rosa Luxemburg has often been misrepresented as an opponent of the October Revolution, standing for some sort of softer, anti-authoritarian Marxism as against that of Lenin and the Bolsheviks. In this book, Marie Fredrickson sets the record straight. Examining her ideas on the basis of what she actually wrote, the book reclaims Rosa Luxemburg as the revolutionary she was. You can order the book now from our website, wellreadbooks.net, for only 12 99 and you can get free shipping till the end of March with the code ROSA1871. Hello everyone, and welcome back to Marxist Voice, the podcast of Socialist Appeal. In recent weeks, there's been a social explosion in the country of Sri Lanka, spurred on by the deep economic crisis, as well as the inept and corrupt government of Gotabaya Rajapaksa. A spontaneous mass movement has emerged, which has been the biggest Sri Lanka has seen in decades. The sort of social unrest that we're seeing now in Sri Lanka, we can expect to see all around the world in the period to come. So it's important that we pay keen attention to these events and draw the lessons as they unfold. On that note, with us today is Ben Curry, a writer and activist with the International Marxist Tendency, who has recently been reporting on these events for Marxist.com, the website of the IMT. Uh, hi Ben, how's it going? I'm very well, Jack. How are you doing? Yeah, I'm great. And yeah, it's a pleasure to have you uh, on the podcast. Um, so I guess just to jump straight into things, um, could you sort of explain uh, what, what's happening in Sri Lanka right now and what are the latest uh, developments? Yeah, well, I mean, events in Sri Lanka have been uh, picking up pace really for the past few week, uh, weeks. Uh, for the past month, really, you've seen protests on the streets of Sri Lanka. And uh, these protests are against the deplorable living conditions which pe- people are facing. The country is essentially on the, uh, well, it, it has now actually declared that it's not going to repay its debts. Um, it's declared uh, bankruptcy effectively. Um, it's run out of foreign reserves. And it's on it, uh, and, and you're running out of basic essential goods, uh, f- uh, cooking fuel, uh, petrol, diesel, uh, electricity blackouts that last, well, now up to 13 hours long in a day. Bearing in mind, of course, there's only really uh, you know, 15 waking hours in the day. Uh, so the majority of the day, the, the, the electricity is out and, and living conditions have become utterly desperate for the majority of people. Um, inflation is skyrocketing in double digits, uh, but food inflation is something like 30%. And even the price of a candle has become unaffordable for, you know, vast parts of the population. So life has become unbearable. And uh, th- that really um, precipitated a massive explosion on the 31st of March. So the end of last month, two weeks ago, almost exactly now, when uh, you saw mass protests erupt spontaneously, there was no leadership to this, no political party, no trade union or anything like that in the leadership. Just the masses uh, have their back up against the wall and and you had this explosion of anger. And in particular, uh, the focus of that anger was the the president and the prime prime minister. They're both brothers, actually. They, They belong to a clan known as the Rajapakshas. And um, there was a, a huge amount of anger demanding that these people resign, uh, saying, where is our stolen money? Uh, pay for the debt with the, uh, uh, with, with the Pandora dollars. In other words, a reference to the fact that this family has been implicated in the Pandora papers, embezzling money, uh, you know, public money. Um, and a huge, this, just a huge outburst of anger across Colombo, um, which is the capital city. Uh, in particular, you had thousands of people descended upon the the president the president's own personal residence, and uh, a state of emergency was quickly declared, uh, a curfew which lasted the whole weekend, um, and the, the government panicked. Um, but the protests have only really escalated from there. Um, the, the 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 weekend after the, the this uh, this explosion of anger in in Colombo, you saw an escalation of, of, of protests across the whole island and people from all backgrounds have been have been involved in this. Um, Tamils, uh, 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 Christians, Muslims. It's cut across religious divisions, other divisions within society. All of the masses have been swept up with this, particularly the youth are at the forefront of this movement. And um, it has caused a crisis in, in the government and in parliament as well. Uh, you've seen um, 42 MPs have resigned from the governing coalition. Uh, all of the the vast majority of the uh, uh, ministers from the cabinet have uh, have have resigned, and the, the government's unable to find anyone to replace them with because basically no one wants to be tarred with association with the Rajapaksas. 
But it's not just the Rajapaksas themselves who have been the target of the anger of the masses. Another slogan that has come out from the streets, as well as these, you know, these slogans that really demonstrate a class anger, um, has been, um, as well as go home gotta, which is a reference to the fact that he has gotta, um, gotta by a Rajapaksa, the, the president, has American citizenship. You know, he lives a very nice life, you know, has a residence in the United States, as does the rest of his, the members of his, his clan. Um, that's what that's a reference to. The the other slogan that's been raised as well is "Go Home" uh, 225, a reference to the 225 MPs in the Parliament. In other words, there's a massive distrust not just of the governing pro-capitalist bourgeois party of the Rajapaksa clan, but of all of the bourgeois parties. A, 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 a sick and tired uh, anger towards the entire establishment and the, the opposition included, who've tried to you know cloak themselves in. In, 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 uh, uh, as if they're sympathetic to this mass movement. Of course, they're not sympathetic whatsoever. They've also had their hand in preparing this, the conditions which uh, are now um, making the suffering of the Sri Lankan people unbearable. And um, this movement has, has reached, a, reached a peak really last Saturday when you had 100,000 people marched in Colombo um, and particularly occupied a, a luxury park area on the beach side called Gullface Green which is adjacent to the presidential secretariat building. And they've been occupied, that's been overwhelmingly youth. Uh, there's a sense of euphoria in, in, in this, this mass uh, occupation, basically. And so there's been a continuous occupation since then for, of, of, of tens of thousands of youth, particularly in the evenings. It's swelled to 40, 50,000 every night. Um, and that, that, that's been going on come rain or shine. I mean, it's the monsoon season is coming on in, in Sri Lanka at the moment. And there's extremely heavy downpours, as you can imagine. Uh, but the people have, have stayed there despite that. Um, they're, they're continuing to occupy despite the fact that it is the Sinhala and the Tamil New Year now. Um, so festi fest festivities are going on. But the masses are determined to stay on the streets until uh, the, the, the Rajapaksa clan is ousted from power. Um, but fundamentally, that it is the crisis of capitalism which has driven the masses onto the streets. Mm -hmm, yeah, and I'd just like to go back to something you said uh, at the beginning. There, uh, you referenced uh, state debt and and, and this uh, sort of uh, bankruptcy. Uh, basically, the government have declared uh, bankruptcy. To whom do they owe this debt? Um, I think I, I read, uh, you know, in your article recently that um, you know the government have appealed to the IMF, for example. But also, I, I know that uh, China as well are um, are quite heavily invested in, in the Sri Lankan economy as well. So, uh, yeah, how does this tie basically to um, you know the, the different imperialist powers that uh, have uh, sway in Sri Lankan in, in the Sri Lankan economy? Well, um, yeah, I think that the short answer is that that Sri Lanka, the Sri Lankan state, is in debt to. A whole number of capitalist interests um, to Western imperialism, to Western capitalists, to Indian capitalists, to Japanese capitalists, and also yes, to China, to China as well. Um, of course, it's the latter in particular which is uh, <clears throat> inflated uh, in in the Western media um, because, of course, China is the main uh, is the main bogeyman of Western capitalism. Um, but in fact, only ten percent of Sri Lanka's debt is actually to uh, China. Um, and uh, you, you have this narrative that is kind of put forward in the Western media that you have this Chinese debt trap, basically, that China is lending money to so-called third world developing countries. Um, and that when they are unable to pay these things, that then various parts of the infrastructure are given over to China. And a famous example of that is the port on the southern coast of Sri Lanka. But actually, large parts of, of uh, Sri Lanka's infrastructure have been given over, not just to Chinese capitalists, but also to to Indian capitalists, to, uh, to American capitalists. Sri Lanka is a playground for uh, foreign imperialism fundamentally. Um, but uh, I think it's, there's, there's nothing unique really about the crisis in Sri Lanka. In many ways, it reflects similar processes which we're seeing, ongoing, seeing going on around the world everywhere. Um, and in many ways, Sri Lanka, I think, shows much of the world its own future. It's in, obviously in a very acute phase of this economic crisis. But it's the same fundamental driving forces that we've seen going on everywhere. Um, in, in, 20, in 2020, of course, when the pandemic first erupted onto the scene, um, you had a situation where the rich countries could, to a certain extent, cushion themselves. They could bail out their own domestic capitalists. They could uh, um, even uh, uh, bail out workers to a certain extent. Um, and of course, you did see a ballooning of, of state debt. 
but you didn't have the layers of fat in these in these poor countries and they were hit in in a number of ways that uh, the rich countries were not M each country in its own particular way in sri lanka for example you saw a complete drying up of tourism which was a big sector of the economy um that had already been massively impacted by the Easter bombings in 2019 in Colombo, which obviously um, deterred a lot of tourists from going there. You saw remittances dry up, not just, of course, in Sri Lanka, but Sri Lanka in particular, one of the biggest uh, exports, if you can describe it as that, is, is, is this question of uh, is, is remittances, human labor. It's, it's workers that go abroad and then send money back. But many of those workers returned home with the, the onset of the pandemic uh, to, to, to bail out basically the, the, the the, the Sri Lankan capitalists, which, by the way, the Rajapaksas, when they came in on the back of the bombings in 2019, they were, they had the overwhelming support of the Sri Lankan capitalist class. And one of the first things they did was introduce massive tax cuts to benefit the Sri Lankan capitalists. So they had, they had the backing of the Sri Lankan ruling class. They introduced these tax cuts, and of course, that then immediately preceded the uh, um, uh, the pandemic. And so you had this sort of combination of of you know, government income already being slashed because of these tax cuts to the rich. And then, of course, um, government income also collapsing and, and f foreign reserves dwindling because of a massive accumulation of debt and also the main exports being impacted by the pandemic. So from all of these different angles, you see the crisis of capitalism has, has caused a, a real crisis, basically, of, uh, uh, of government finances. Um, of, but also, a large part of that has been the Rajapaksas themselves who have compounded this with their incompetence, with their stupidity. It's just like we see in, in Britain today, right? Of course, the, Britain has been lurching from one crisis to the next, you know, from Brexit the, to the, the Scottish independence referendum, the, you know, one thing after another, political scandals and sleaze. But of course, that the, the crisis of British capitalism is compounded by the, the, the crudeness, the stupidity of the representatives of British capital. And we see the same thing in Sri Lanka. Yes, it is the crisis of capitalism, but it's also aggravated by the, 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 the crudeness, the ignorance, the stupidity, the corruption of the ruling clique itself. They've been a very important factor in that situation. But there's nothing fundamentally unique, I don't think, um, about the situation here. What we're seeing is countries around the world um, are facing a similar situation where they are being poorer countries, particularly since 2020, are being crushed by huge amounts of debt on the one hand, and on the other side, of course, massive spiraling inflation, which is uh, precisely what we see in Sri Lanka. And it's interesting, two of the countries that have come with a certain amount of money to try and bail out Sri Lanka have been India on the one hand, and also uh, Bangladesh, which has lent uh, several hundred million pounds worth of its foreign reserves to Sri Lanka. Now, why is that? It's, it's for one reason and one reason only is that these countries in the region want to basically help bridge this social explosion. They, they are worried about the contagion of revolution, basically. And so there's nothing fundamentally unique about Sri Lanka in that respect. Yeah, I think that's a very important uh, point to make. Uh, now, just to go on to the the, the uh, you know the response of of, of, the, of the government to this to this movement. I mean, you've mentioned uh, their ineptitude and, and their sort of uh, crude crudeness. Um, you know. What has been the response to this this, this movement? Um, you know, I, I've seen uh, you know incidents online, for example, of uh, you know the government using quite heavy-handed measures to, to deal with these protests, which have been in large part a very peaceful protests. I think I I saw a, a tweet where you know there were some armed forces with uh, with automatic weapons, for example. So it seems, at least to me, that you know the response has been so far one of, one of repression. But has there been any attempt at sort of a carrot and stick approach, where there's promises of reforms, for example? It seems like uh, Rajapaksa is in a pretty pretty awkward situation. He's backed into a corner now. You know, a lot of his of his own uh, um, you know, ministers and so on are sort of uh, don't really want to want to want to um, help him anymore. Uh, so, yeah, what 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 lies ahead for the for for, for the government, and, and what has their response been so far? Well, I think that the, the first thing is uh, it's worth taking a step back. Um, you know, the, Raj the Rajapaksas were in power before in 2005 to, to 2015. Uh, actually, it was the, the brother of the current president, uh, Mahinda Rajapaksa, who was the president at that time. You, you see how these, <laughs> these people, <laughs> they just uh, rotate positions, you know, yeah, what, revolving you, door, yeah. it's your turn now to be president and, and I'll be prime minister. And and then you can be finance, you know, it's, it's a, you can see the, this, this rotten clique, you know, this family that, that um, are, are in power, the, the sheer nepotism of this government. But when they were in power then, 
um, they they were an ex- they they enacted an extremely brutal regime. Not only did they in two thousand nine they put an end to the, um, the the war in the the northeast, um, crushing the, the the Tamil population, carrying out all sorts of atrocities to finally snuff out the civil war against the the, the Tamil Tigers. Not only that, but in uh, in, in twenty nineteen. Uh, they came to power in two elections in 2019 and in 2020. Yeah, you had uh, elections which brought the Rajapaksas once more into government. And they came to government on the basis of um, of, of really right-wing chauvinist demagogy after these, after these uh, terrorist attacks, which uh, it's uncertain who's the author of these attacks, by the way. You know, it's the, the Islamic State uh, claimed responsibility for these bombings in Easter 2019. Um, and on the back of that, you had a, a wave of, uh, of, of anti-Muslim riots, burnings of Qurans and, and um, you know, sacking of mosques and this sort of stuff, a, a chauvinist uh, wave. And the, uh, um, the, there is some indication that uh, there's some suggestion, I should say, that uh, actually the state may have had a hand in this or, you know, and it wouldn't be the first time that we've seen, you know, the, the, the ruling class either turn a blind eye to, you know, terrorist attacks or, or terrorist conspiracies. In order to to, to ride the wave, the, ride, ride the wave of chauvinism that follows in their wake, but in um, <clears throat> on the back of these attacks in 2019, that was when the Rajapaksas came to power. They came to power on the back of basically uh, fear of going back to the violence. Of they said to people, you know, we were the ones who put an end to the civil war back in 2009. You know, vote for us, otherwise there's going to be a return to this violence. There's going to be, you know, um, we will be the ones who will protect the uh, Sinhala Buddhist majority um, of uh, of Sri Lanka against the other groups who want to deprive you of your rights and so forth. So it was really on the back of this chauvinist wave, you know, racial division, all of this sort of stuff. Now, one of the most remarkable features of this mass movement has been precisely the fact that it has cut across all of this racist poison, everything like that. Uh, this ma- this mass protest and occupation in Gullface Green, you see Christians, Muslims, uh, uh, Tamils. As well as as well as even um, young members of the uh, f- from the young monks, uh, Buddhist monks, turning up to the protest as well. Um, incidentally, that the, the hierarchy of the uh, um, you know the Buddhist hierarchy are reviled actually because of the role they've played in in bigging up the Rajapaksas. Um, but there's been there's been unity across the divisions that the ruling class and particularly the Rajapaksas have attempted to spread in society. Um, and so the uh, yeah the, there's been an attempt to sort of you know, demagogy on the part of the, the Rajapaksas. They've tried to sort of spread poison and, and this sort of thing and uh, division. But the masses are resisting this. They've seen through this game. They've, they've had several years of, of, uh, of, of this sort of, you know, verbiage of this sort of, these sort of speeches. And now look at their conditions. They're, not, they're determined not to be uh, divided in this sort of manner. Um, but yes, the, the immediate response of the government was to issue threats uh, it was to denounce the protests, particularly a couple of weeks ago when they were outside the doors of the uh, the, the president. And the Monday after, you had huge protests all around Colombo and else or across the island, in fact, and outside many of the ministers' houses. And those ministers shortly after resigned, but the, the, they, you had big protests of people outside the houses. Um, and they were denouncing these as the result of violent agitators and extremists. <clears throat> Where there has been violence, it seems... Of, of course, it's actually been on the part of the of the states who have you know used uh, tear gas and and water cannon and this sort of thing, and also have have tried to infiltrate the protests with agent provocateurs to try to to justify repression, but they've had to move quite carefully the Rajapaksas because um, there have been indications of members of the police force actually um, cheering on the protests and this sort of thing. S- small indications of the mood, but it's not quite clear that the uh, uh, the rank and file of the police and of the armed forces are are one hundred percent in spirit with the Rajapaksas. You know, they they are affected by the inflation. They're affected by the the the, the long power cuts. They're affected by all of these things. They're affecting not just the working class but also middle class layers, um, and all, all different sections of society. Yeah, and I'd also like to ask as well um, what what has been the response of uh, the other. Other parties and, and organisations, I guess, as well. Um, you mentioned that some of, of, of the parties uh, in Parliament um, have tried to co-opt this this movement to an extent. I think, uh, you know, members of the SJB, which is one of the sort of opposition parties, a bourgeois opposition party, have been holding up placards 
and mimicking the slogans that have been thrown up by this mass movement. Uh, do you think this is going to work or do you think the masses are just going to see straight through this? Well, yeah, I think that the uh, the, the attitude of the um, the opposition has been to sort of try to present themselves as on the side of the, the people, but they've had a much easier time of it when they've been in the parliamentary chamber than when they've been outside on the streets. You have had attempts by opposition MPs to turn up on the streets and they have been by and large chased off and uh, given uh, a very little time by the protesters. And in fact, the one of the, yeah, the key slogans that has been raised has been precisely this slogan of, uh, you know, out with the 225, out with all of the MPs. Um, and the SJB, the main opposition, actually comes from um, comes from the UMP, uh, which is basically the, tradi the traditional party of the Sri Lankan capitalist class. Now they are accusing, um, you know, the, the Rajapaksas of of playing with chauvinism and of strengthening the presidency to create this authoritarian president presidential system. But they were the ones who started a, along this route. You know, they were the ones who have. Uh, uh, just just like we see all around the world, the, the liberals and the centre grounds complaining about the, the Trumps and the Boris Johnsons and Brexiteers and the Marine Le Pens, not forget, not remembering the fact, of course, it was they who who, who allowed these people to, to, to rise to power. They were the ones, they flirted with chauvinism, they've attacked the working class, they've discredited themselves, they've opened the ground for these demagogues. Um, so this, the, you know, the parties like the U UMP now calling itself the, the SJB have... Uh, they prepared the grounds for the pe people like the Rajapaksa. So they have a much easier time pretending that they're on the side of the people uh, when they're in the parliamentary chamber. But their aim is fundamentally the same as the Rajapaksa's. That their, goal, that their, their means of achieving it is different. They want to get the masses off the street. And whereas the Rajapaksa's are biding their time and trying to prepare the ground for repression, which is very difficult when the, ma the mass movement is, is, is so strong and moving forward. Um, the opposition wants to tie the uh, to tie this movement up in the parliamentary games, um, in in preparing the the ground for you know we need to change the constitution, we need to introduce an amendment to the constitution to clip the wings of the president, this sort of thing, as if there is some improved, perfect bourgeois democracy that is possible in Sri Lanka. The, the, the Bonapartist character of the Sri Lankan constitution. And it is; it does concentrate a lot of power in what is called the executive presidency, is an expression of the fact that the the social crisis in Sri Lanka is and has that the social polarization, sorry, in Sri Lanka at, is and has been for decades extremely acute. And the only way to achieve a certain semblance of stability is to place a lot of power in the executive and in the presidency. Um, that is what has caused the the, the rise of this increasingly. Um, um, you know, authoritarian presidential system that you see in, in, in Sri Lanka. So what we would say is that the masses should have no um, should have no trust in any of these opposition parties and no illusion that you can create some better, more perfect bourgeois democracy in Sri Lanka. Um, in actual fact, the, the, uh, th this crisis is, as I mentioned before, you know, it is, it is a, a crisis of capitalism and it's only the working class that can fundamentally uh, offer a way out. Now there is something very progressive in this slogan of uh, you know out with the 225 MPs. It shows a, a healthy distrust of the uh, um, of of all of the bourgeois parties. But it also has its weak side as well because it's not just enough to know what you're against. You have to know what you you are for as well. And the masses. Um, uh, instinctively rejecting all, all parties and all organizations that has a that has a healthy side it means that the movement can't be co-opted it means it can't be bought off but it also has a very weak side as well because of course the masses need a leadership they need a party not of the type of the bourgeois parties but a party of the working class to offer a clear program to offer a clear way out for the masses you mentioned that the movement is strong, but of course, you know, it is it is spontaneous as well. And there is a, a healthy element to that. Um, but, you know, it seems to me that, that, that it isn't, you know, a very organized at this stage. There Has there been any sort of like political uh, expression, any kind of political leadership that's been offered by any of the sort of existing parties or indeed the, the trade unions or anything basically at the minute? Because it seems to me like uh, without that leadership and without a sort of program to give this movement cohesion and, and uh, sustain it, that it will just fizzle out like many of these movements do. So does anything exist currently? And yeah, what will it take for uh, this movement to, to carry on forward? 
Well, I mean, there are, you know, there are opposition parties that uh, that, that exist in Sri Lanka. Um, there is a, a party, for example, called the JVP, which um, uh, actually, if if you look at Sri Lankan, this is the, the tragedy of Sri Lankan history, is that you, you have had massive uh, left-wing parties, even Trotskyist parties. The, um, you had the LSSP, uh, the Lanka Sama Samaja Party, was actually a party which, you know, it was a Trotskyist party. It was, it was a section of the, the Fourth International. And uh, in the 1950s, it led a heroic struggle of the, uh, of the workers. And uh, in 1953, I believe, they led a Hartal, which was basically a general strike um, in, in Sri Lanka. But that party um, betrayed, it sold out, and it went into a government which was a popular front with the bourgeois parties. And that led to it becoming discredited and the rise actually of the Maoists, uh, the, the, the JVP party, who uh, launched a number of insurrections, um, basically in their own way, they tried to seize power, but they, they fundamentally um, had an incorrect conception of how to seize power. They, they, they tried to carry out these, uh, these, these insurrections disconnected from the masses, mostly based in the youth. They were crushed as a result of that. Now this party continues to exist, um, but its program is a traditional Stalinist program of of two, a two stage approach basically what we need first is a bourgeois democratic revolution which creates the you know the best conditions for bourgeois democracy and capitalist development presumably in in sri lanka but as i as i said the the point is that there, there cannot be any perfection or any further development really of capitalism in sri, uh, on the basis of capitalism in sri lanka it is it is capitalism as a world system it is imperialism which is which is dragging um, society down, which is draining the lifeblood out of the country, which is sucking out its foreign reserves and leaving the people in pitch darkness at night. It's capitalism as a system, as a global system, because there isn't some special kind of, you know, national capitalism or, or, or uh, you know, capitalism with a smiling face. There's only one global capitalist system, and that system is dragging Sri Lanka into the mire, as it is all of the country, all, all other countries around the world. But this party, up until the recent wave of protest, was, you know, it was gaining to a certain extent. Um, uh, but it's had to, it's, it too has found it very difficult to intervene in these protests. It's, it's tried to do so. In Gullface Green, for example, it's, you know, that it sent uh, its, its members down, uh, but they're not able to present themselves clearly as, as, a, as a party. And it's, it too has been discredited to a certain extent in the process of this, of this mass movement. Um, but its program is basically well, we need in two or three years' time, we need to elect a new president. You know, you need to elect us as president or what have you. Uh, complete, complete parliamentary cretinism. While the masses are on the street to 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 call for the masses to to vote for your party in two or three years' time is 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 completely reactionary. It's to di to diffuse the movement to sow illusions in parliamentarism. When really, if we look at the situation now, power is in the hands of the masses in in Sri Lanka. The uh, uh, the fact of the matter is they are simply not conscious of this fact and that no party is giving it an expression and no trade union is actually giving it an expression. What is interesting about this, this occupation of Gullface Green in, uh, in, in Colombo is the, the, the initial protest on the weekend, of course, when everyone's off work, you have 100,000 people marching down to Gullface Green. Now you have a small, you, you've had a camp established there with tents and so on. And it's very similar to, to what you've seen in the Occupy movement and these sort of things that we're maybe familiar with in other countries, um, where there has been spontaneous organization by the masses. You know, you have uh, kitchens established, um, uh, mobile phone charging areas, uh, rest areas, uh, shelter when, uh, and, and raincoats for when the, uh, the torrential rain comes down. Um, so there is, there is you know the capacity for organization but the uh, uh the fact is that these 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 this occupation dwindles to a few thousand during the day and it's in the evening at night when people are off work because there is no general strike going on people are still going to work and then they come down and, and it swells to tens of thousands of people in the evenings and at night time um in other words it's it's the the, the trade unions are not providing a lead whatsoever and in this situation, if the trade unions were to provide a lead, because in many instances, workers are going down independently without being called to go down to Gullface Green in Colombo, uh, they're just doing so spontaneously. If the trade unions began agitating in all of the workplaces, 
uh, called mass assemblies in all of the workplaces explains the need for an all-out general strike to bring down the Rajapaksa regime, uh, established workplace committees in all of the workplaces and called for their establishment in every community, in every fishing village, in every single part of the country, um, and then connected up these, these committees, you would have, the working class would have power in its hands. Um, and everything that is accidental about this mass movement would be would be uh, uh, brushed aside, and you, it would be stamped with a clear class character. Um, there is, a, a, and the working class would bring the rest of the masses in behind it, behind a program for what? A program to basically abolish capitalism in Sri Lanka, to take over the commanding heights of the economy. In one of uh, the, the articles that I wrote recently, you have these these positive statements coming out from all of the big capitalists in Sri Lanka. Like the biggest, uh, the, the biggest supermarket was saying how it respects the rights of its employees to go down there. And it's like you, the, the, the biggest supermarket that's ratcheting up prices to squeeze the Sri Lankan people to make your profits. The, the, the big apparel companies, are, you know, it reminds me actually of the Black Lives Matter movement in the United States where all of the, you know, the masses are on the street burning down police precincts and, uh, uh, um, you know, um, extremely radical moods. And then you have, you know, Nike and Ben and Jerry's and stuff like that, putting Black Lives Matter on all of their, uh, you know, all of their stuff. It's this, the, the same sort of thing. But I think if the working class came in in an organized way, it would clarify all of that. It would separate. It, th th there would it would bring clarity to the movement. But unfortunately, as we see in many countries, as we see all around the world, the leadership of the working class is the is the is a the decisive block in the movement moving forward fundamentally. And if the movement doesn't move forward, then it has to move backwards. That is the the thing. We're at a bit of an impasse at the mo at the moment. Um. The, the, the masses are on the street in, in large numbers, um, but of course they can't stay there indefinitely. They either have to move forward in a decisive way or they have to move backward. And when they move backwards, the, the, the reactionaries who've been waiting in the wing, because they're, they're not strong enough at the moment, they've, they've, they're demoralized, they've lost, lost confidence, they will gain confidence in themselves. And of course we've seen the Rajapaksas, what they're capable of. There's, in Ghoulface Green, there is a, there is a, um, a gallery of the, the, the portraits of journalists killed in the last Rajapaksa government from 2005 to 2015, they're an extremely brutal reactionary and repressive regime. Uh, they are waiting to, to get their revenge against this movement. And if the movement doesn't move forward and it is forced to take a step back and people become exhausted, they become tired, they go home as inevitably they must if there isn't a decisive breakthrough, then these, you know, the, the, then the regime will be there and it will be ready to exert its revenge. So that's the, that's the key question, is the question of working class leadership. Yeah, I entirely agree. Um, yeah, is there anything else that you'd like to say? Um, any final points? Um, well, I, I suppose only as a, my only final point would be that, of course, that the, the, the struggle in Sri Lanka is part of a, a global struggle all around the world. There are many lessons from it. Um, you can see that the situation in, in Sri Lanka, it, it bears many similarities to the you know, the Arab Spring of, of, of 10 years ago, it bears many uh, similarities to the movements that we've seen in 2019 in, in Chile, in, uh, in Iraq and elsewhere. Um, it is part of a, a global struggle to uh, fundamentally f to, to fight what? To fight against capitalism. It's, it's, it's part of the, the same struggle that we're involved in in every part of the world as the international Marxist tendency. We do have, you know, a, a, a small group of uh, supporters in Sri Lanka who are doing their best to sort of build uh, the forces of Marxism, and I would simply appeal to um, you know to, to, to comrades listening and, and sympathizers who are listening. If you haven't already joined uh, the International Marxist Tendency or Socialist Appeal in Britain or the International Marxist Tendency in any part of the world, join us and 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 help us build this organisation because the work that we're doing to build here will also help to to to, to build in. In, in Sri Lanka, it will help to build in all other parts of the world. So I would say that that's the the final thing I'd like to end on is to appeal to join the to join this organisation and and help to to build that revolutionary leadership that the working class needs to transform society. So I think we'll leave it there for this week's episode. Thanks very much, Ben, for coming on the podcast. Thank you very much as well. And if you'd like to stay up to date with the, the constantly moving situation in Sri Lanka, then please head to Marxist.com, the website of the International Marxist Tendency, where you can find regular news and analysis from a Marxist perspective, dealing not just with the events in Sri Lanka, but indeed across the world. 
To find out more, head to the link in the show notes of this podcast. And if you agree with the analysis and the perspectives that Ben has put forward, and you want to help to build the forces of Marxism worldwide to carry out a socialist program, then I would encourage you to get involved with the International Marxist Tenants, which is organised in many different countries across the world. On that note, we're also pleased to announce that the IMT's International Marxist University will return this year, promising four days of exciting talks on the fundamental principles of Marxism, including Marxist economics, dialectical materialism, the philosophy of Marxism, as well as historical materialism, the Marxist understanding of history. It's only by understanding and using the method of Marxism that we can make sense of the turmoil that surrounds us today and provide a practical basis to the fight for our future. So if this sounds like something you'd be interested in, head to the link in our show notes to find out more. Make sure you stay tuned for upcoming episodes on the fall of Afghanistan, as well as the French elections. And thanks once again for listening to Marxist Voice, the podcast of Socialist Appeal.